I want to talk to you today on a very, very simple thought, very simple thought that I've titled A Permanent Change, A Permanent Change. So many people are seeking change in their lives. Some people are seeking to change, to get deliverance from addictions, from broken, they want to see broken relationships heal. They want to have something change permanently in their lives, and they're seeking after that, and they're wanting it, they're desiring it. Well, I'm going to tell you today how you can have it. I'm going to give you the answer, how you can have a permanent change in your life, regardless of what your, what your uh, problem is today or what your situation is, you can have a permanent change. The Bible tells us we can. Let me give you a couple of scriptures here. God wants to transform our hearts. He wants to transform our lives. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we all who with unveiled faces... Now, what he means by that statement, that's sort of an Old Testament expression or colloquialism. Uh, he means without anything interfering, without anything stopping you, without, there's no walls, there's, no, there's nothing pretended that's, that's just... He, he's basically saying, I'm just telling you just like it is, without, with unveiled faces, Faces with, without anything stopping us, contemplate the Lord's glory and being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, without anything stopping us, we can be transformed into his image. It's, it's very often, you know, it's easy to uh, make the statement, uh, I'm going to change, you know. And we very, we very often sometimes make, easy, make uh, temporary changes, you know. Do, do you know, uh, I, I read a survey one time. It's been a few years back, but I never will forget. You know what the most, people make this commitment that they're going to change. You know, they'll, they'll make this, I'm going to change. I'm going to do things different. You know what the most broken commitment is each year? The most broken in America, what the most broken commitment is, according to the statistics, all the, the uh, uh, surveys that have been done and everything, it's a New Year's resolution. It's a New Year's resolution. People make New Year's resolutions. I'm going to lose 60 pounds, you know, and after they lose about five pounds, they break it. You know, it's, it's the most broken commitment that we make. We, we tell ourselves or we tell our family or we tell our spouses or whatever, you know, I'm going to do this and this is my New Year's resolution. A week rock, rocks by, maybe a couple of weeks or a month, and then all of a sudden that, that, that resolution is broken. It's easy to make temporary changes, but God wants to transform our hearts and make a permanent change in our lives. That's what he wants to do. He wants us to change permanently, and he wants to help us. He wants to transform us. Don't get so preoccupied in the cares of this life that you, that you neglect the most important things in life. What does the Bible teach are the most important things in life? Natural things or spiritual things? Which is it? Spiritual, that's right. The spiritual things, the Bible says, are that those things that are going to last forever. It's that it, our soul, our spirit's going to live forever. The natural things that we see are temporary. They're going, to, they're going to exist and then they're going to cease to exist. Here's an example in the Bible of what Jesus, how that Jesus stressed the importance of spiritual things over natural things. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus says, now it happened that as they went, well, this is actually Luke writing here, but it's gonna, we're going to quote Jesus here in just a minute. Now it happened that as they went, that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, 
you know, Martha came to Jesus and said, come to my house and eat. I want to welcome you into our, into our home. And so Jesus went to her home and she prepared, you know, I guess probably a feast fit for a king because he was king. You know, she prepared a great meal for him. And uh, she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now check this out. Martha's working like crazy, preparing this feast. Mary, her sister, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to every word, catching every word that he speaks and planting it in her heart. But Martha was distracted with much serving. In other words, Martha wasn't catching if she was catching anything at all, it was probably very little because she was distracted. She was busy. She was cooking. She was, you know, fixing this and fixing that and mixing this together and heating things up in the oven. I don't know what exactly how they had ovens back then. This is 2,000 years ago. But she was getting this big feast ready for everybody, cutting up things, getting it all ready, you know. And she approached Jesus and she said, look, or said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Martha wanted help. She said, therefore, tell her to help me. Tell her to give me some help. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. In other words, Mary considered it more important to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him speak and catch every word and plant it in her heart. That was more important than preparing a meal for him. That was more important to Mary. Now, back then, you got to understand, this was 2,000 years ago. We really don't know what level of uh, the way they looked at Jesus completely because that was 2,000 years ago. And you know, a lot of times when things are happening, we, we fail our, our flesh, in our flesh, we fail to catch the importance of it. Things, things have happened in my life and then I look back on it and I think, wow, if I'd only understood the opportunity that it happened right then. You understand, this was the Son of God. But they might not have understood that. They might not have quite recognized that. They, they, they may have just been thinking, this is a great teacher sitting in our home. And Mary th may have thought, well, I'm going to listen to him teach because he's a great teacher. They uh, probably, at the, by then, they knew, of course, that he was also a great, you know, that he'd worked miracles. He'd done some miracles. He'd done some things. But, but, but they might not have grasped that he was actually the son of God, God incarnate in flesh. So they, so, so, Martha, you know, thinks, well, I'll, I'll listen to him teach after a while. You know, he's a great man and I'll, I'll catch it. Right now, I've got to prepare this magnificent dinner for him or this magnificent banquet for Jesus. So that's what she does. She thinks that the greatest thing that she can do for Jesus is to prepare something for him rather than to listen to what he says. You know, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God, from God. So Mary was catching the teaching while Martha was preparing the big meal. Martha wanted to impress Jesus. Mary wanted to learn from Jesus. That's the difference. Therefore, do not worry, saying what we shall eat or what we shall drink. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, this is Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying what we shall eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. Now, the word Gentiles there means a pagan or an unbeliever, someone that doesn't believe in Jesus, that maybe don't even believe in God at all. Actually, probably that is a pagan or somebody that doesn't even believe in God at all. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first. Everybody say first. first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, 
shall be added to you. When you put God first in your life, above everything else, all the things that you desire or that you need will be added. God will add it. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over again and again in my life. Do you chase after things or do you seek after God? Think about it. Do you chase after things or do you seek after God? If, if I don't believe in Jesus Christ and trust in God, then I have no expectations that he's my provider. That he's going to provide all I need. If I don't believe that God is going to provide for me, then I'm going to try to fix everything and provide for myself. In other words, if you're not trusting in God, then who are you trusting in? You're trusting in your own strength. I'm going to lean on my own wisdom, my own understanding, and my own abilities. That's just natural. Jesus is saying, you don't have to chase after everything you need or want. If you will seek after me first, if you will seek after God first, if you will put God first, he says, I will give you everything you want. <laughs> Praise God. If you seek after him first, the change that you desire, if you're struggling with addictions, alcoholism, drugs, if you're struggling with, with uh, you know, any, any other problems in your life, financial problems, relationship problems, whatever you might be struggling with, if you seek Jesus first, if you put him above everything else, the change that you desire you're going to experience it. It's going to happen. Amen. I promise you, I know God's word is true and it cannot fail. When you put him first, that change will come. The key to permanent change is putting God first. That's the key. It's putting God first in our lives. Somebody, one time I was preaching about how that you should put God first in your life. I was preaching something similar to this, not exactly the same message, but, and I was talking about how that God's more important than your spouse. And this person, he got mad. I mean, he got, he got upset with the preacher, you know. Pastor, don't tell me God's more important than my spouse. Yes, he is. The Bible says he is. God wants to be number one in your life above everything. Your spouse, your children, your family, your father, your mother. He wants to be number one. And when he's number one, everything else just falls in place. Everything else works out. I believe that the reason that so many families are dysfunctional is because you got family members in that family, nobody's putting God first. They're not putting God first. If they put God first in their lives, they wouldn't be a dysfunctional family. Everything would be normal. I say normal. I guess that's the right word to use. <laughs> the key to permanent change is putting God first. The order matters. You got to put God first in your life. Amen. Packing groceries. You ever packed groceries? You don't put the bread and the eggs and the potato chips in the bottom of the bag. If you do, you're going to have a problem. The order matters. Those eggs are going to, going to get cracked. The bread's going to be smushed. And the potato chips are going to be just little tiny pieces. They'll be all broke up. Unless you want to ruin stuff, you got to pack it in the right order. Jesus said to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as yourself. Notice the order. Look at your neighbor and say, notice the order. Notice the order. Love God first. Love God. Then you can love others. Then the other relationships will flourish. Love God first. When you put God first, you will experience the transforming power of God. What does it mean to put God first? Well, number one, 
What you put first determines your capacity. Now, I'm going to explain that to you here in a minute, okay? What you put first will determine your capacity. Your capacity for God to work in your life. You may say, well, if I put God first, then you mean I'm opening the door? I'm opening my capacity for him to work in your life? Yes, you are. It's exactly what you're doing. The definition of capacity, if you, you can go online and you can look this up, is the maximum amount that something can contain. The maximum amount that something can contain. Your refrigerator has a certain capacity. Did you know that? Your freezer has a certain capacity, and it's usually measured in cubic feet. They measure it in cubic feet. You're only going to get so much meat in that freezer, and it's going to match, it's going to match up to the cubic feet, and once you reach that cubic feet, you're not going to get another piece of meat in there. You're not going to get, not going to get another steak in that, in, that, in that freezer. Are the refrigerator the same way? Of course, usually we have space in our refrigerator between the top of the milk and the next shelf. But so refrigerators don't get packed as tight as freezers. But my point being is that once you fill that refrigerator up with food, and I'm talking about every square foot, you're not going to get anything else in there. It's full. Same thing for a freezer. And lots of other stuff. An elevator has a maximum capacity. I've gotten on elevators before. <laughs> and I mean, that elevator was packed. You know, you ever gotten on an elevator and, whew, it's full of people. In fact, two or three big people walk on there, you know, and you're sitting there looking at them and you look up and you see this little sign that says maximum capacity. I want to get off. <laughs> Let me out of here. This thing's rising. It's a long way to the bottom. It's a long way down. It has a maximum capacity. That's it. The amplified translation of what Jesus said is this. He says it like this. He said, but first and most importantly, seek. That is, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness. His way of doing and being right. The attitude and the character of God and all these things will be given to you. All these things that you want will be given to you. And number two, God only brings, room, brings increase, rather. He only brings increase when we have room in our lives for it. Sometimes you have to make room. You have to make room for it. He's only going to bring increase when, when you make room for it in your life. So many people are praying and they're asking God and God, I need this. God, bless me. Bless me with that. You know, but what they need to understand is that God will only bring increase when they make room for it. God can't fill a place. He can't fill a place where there's no room. Think about it. When the Son of God came into this world, Jesus Christ was born. There was no room for him in the inn. They couldn't get in that inn that night because there was no place for them to stay. So they had to stay. You know where they went? They went to the place where there was room for them. And it was, it was a, a stable. It was a stable where the sheep and the goats and the oxen and maybe even camels were there. And Jesus was wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. You know what a manger was? A feed trough for the pigs or maybe the donkeys or the horse. That's what a manger is. A lot of people, oh, it sounds so, oh, way in a manger, no. What's the next part of the line? I forgot it. <laughs> Anyways, you know, we, we sing that and it sounds so beautiful. It's a, it's a feed trough 
for sheep and oxen. And that's where Jesus was laid. Because that's the only place where there was room for Jesus. If you want a permanent change, you got to make room for Jesus in your life. You've got to make room for Jesus in your life. God can't fill a place where there's no room. And number three, when we put God first, we have the capacity for change. Then when you put God first, you're going to have the capacity. You're going to be able to change. The change will come natural. What God is saying is this. What you currently lack will be given to you if the order of your life is right. God first, then spouse, then children, then your occupation, your work, and so forth and so on. Way on down the list is your, is your uh, hobbies and other interests, whatever you enjoy doing, hunting, fishing, camping, you know, sports. Some people love football, baseball, whatever. That's way down the list. Way down the list. Got to put God first. What it really boils down to, whatever you currently lack is going to be given to you if the order in your life is right. And what it really boils down to is that you have to have faith and you have to trust God. That's the bottom line. You've got to have faith and you've got to trust God. Do I really believe that God has my best interest at heart? Do I really believe that God's way is better than my way? Do I really believe that God's power will work on my behalf? Think about that. Do I really believe that? You know, there's a lot of people that say they believe it, but their actions... You ever heard that old phrase, your actions are speaking louder than your words. Their actions are speaking louder than their words. Their choices, their decisions are speaking louder than their words. I have hesitated to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways because I, because I feel God leading me to say it. I'm probably talking to somebody online, but I might be talking to somebody in this building. So many people nowadays... On Sunday morning, you know, they got these soccer teams and baseball tournaments and all kinds of stuff going on on Sunday mornings, and they're skipping church all the time to go to that stuff. When you're doing that, you're putting that, you're putting, whether you realize it or not, you're putting that ahead of God. You're putting that ahead of God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't take a vacation. Somebody said, well, Pastor, you're saying I can't ever miss church. Of course you can take a vacation. Of course you can do things occasionally, you know, that, that, that have to be done or that you want to do, that you want to enjoy yourself at. But you've got to consistently in your life put God first. It doesn't mean you can't take a vacation. It doesn't mean you can't, doesn't mean you can't miss church or not come to Wednesday night Bible study for whatever reason because something came up and you had to work late or whatever. But my point being, put God first and you will open up the capacity for him to work in your life. And he will begin to work. Praise God. Hallelujah. If I don't trust that God is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he will do, you know what that is? Then that's pride working in my heart. It's me saying to God that I think my way is better. If I can just control it, then I'll get the right outcome. If I can be in control of it, I'll get the right outcome. That's pride. Psalms 9:10 says, those who know your name Trust in you. This is David writing concerning God. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. 
Hallelujah. He doesn't abandon those who search after him. Those who put him first, those who seek after him, he does not abandon them. Those who trust in you, they know your name and they trust in you. Not money, not trust in money, not trust in abilities, not trust in their own wisdom, but they trust in you, Lord. I want to show you a little illustration here this morning. How many of you believe that the order matters? Let me see your hand. You believe the order matters? Come on, put your hand up just for a minute. Just hold. You believe the order matters? Order matters. Putting God first matters. I'm going to show you. This side represents a life where God is not first. And this side represents a life where God is first. So keep that in mind as I show you this. God is not first here. God is first here. Okay? So, you may wonder what this is. Now, these are exactly the same containers, except we cut the tops off of them, but we cut them exactly the same place. So, they're the same. They're exactly, virtually, virtually, except for maybe like if you were filling them with water, you might be one or two drops off, okay? But they're virtually exactly the same, okay? They're exactly the same size. And this is a bunch of screws and nuts and bolts and stuff that I had left from the computer business from years ago. I had them in a drawer at home in my garage, and I said, well, I'm just going to bring this. It's shiny stuff, shiny things that we like in our lives. And they, so a lot of times it's things that we just have to do. We've got to take care of in our lives. Like, you know, we've got to do the laundry. We've got we to wash, wash our laundry and dry our laundry. We've got to... Take the kids to school and pick the kids up when school's over. We got to cook dinner for the family. You know, we got to we got to do this. We got we got to pay the bills. We got to pay the bills. And it's not necessarily stuff that you just have to do. It's just all the little bitty things that you do. And every once in a while, you might want to watch a movie. You know, that might be that might be one of the little things. Now, the little things that we do in our lives are all represented by these nuts and nuts and bolts and screws. The nuts and bolts of life. The nuts and bolts of life. Now, in addition to those little things that we do in our lives, uh, let's see. Let's get this right now. Hobbies. Hobbies. We might, we might have a hobby that we really enjoy. So we'll put that in there. There's a hobby. Uh we have work to do around the house. Actually, I kind of already mentioned it, but here's, here's a rock that represents it. We, uh, we have to, you know, clean the house, shampoo the carpet every once in a while, or vacuum the carpet, clean the kitchen, clean the bathtubs, clean the restrooms. We just got work that's got to be done around the house. You know, every once in a while, we got to fix and mend the blinds and the curtains, and, you know, everything's got to be fixed occasionally. Maybe a shingle on top of the house and a heavy windstorm, you got to fix, get up there and fix that shingle so, you, so it doesn't leak when you have the next rain. You know, anybody ever been down that road before, right? Somebody, somebody understands. I see hands going up. So, you know, this, I put homework, but really that's just housework is what it is. How, things that need to be done around the house and taken care of, okay? So let's put that in there, okay? Now, oh, education's important. Education. You know, to accomplish and get ahead in life, you're going to have to t always do some kind of education. My wife was teaching teaching at the school for six and a half years. And every summer they made her do continuing education stuff that she had to do. So, so you don't just learn when you're going to school or when you're going to college, but even after you graduate from college and after you start working, there's always going to be updates and things that, new things that you have to learn and new things that you have to master in order to stay in your field, to stay in your, in your profession, okay? So it's like nowadays, everything is computerized. Go back about 30 years ago, almost everything was on paper and in, and, in, and in folders and in locked up in file cabinets. But now it's all on computer files, right? Somebody had to learn how to put everything on computers. So education is important. It's, it's always, when you stop learning, you stop growing. That's simple. You're going to stop growing when you stop learning. So let, let's put that in here, okay? Okay. Um, for some people, social media is important. You know, 
To them, it's so important to go online, you know, and put their pictures of their kids and pictures of their family and pictures of their grandkids. So this is this says social media, social media. So, you know, that's that's important for some people. OK. And then finally, uh, you know, well, work, period, your occupation, what you do for a living. You know, you got to do something to pay the electric bill, right? to pay, pay for the groceries and make the car payment and the insurance and all that. This is your occupation, represents your occupation, okay? Now, we have family, family, family. See, we're going up the ladder here. We started out with the things that are insignificant or almost insignificant, and they're just getting more and more and more important. Family, children, your mom, your dad, all your family. Let's put them right there. And then finally... God. Here's God right here. He is the rock of my salvation, right? Here's God. Okay, so we're going to put God on top. Whoop. Won't fit in there, will it? Sticking out the top. Virtually the whole thing sticking out the top. It will not go down inside this. There's no way I could get a lid on this. God does not fit in this. Because I got the order wrong. I got the order wrong. God doesn't fit. You can't, you can't get a lid on this. And of course, the object of this is to get a lid on top of it. It'd be impossible with this rock right here. God. God. You got to get the order right. So number one, first thing I do in my life, I put God first. God, this represents my life in the right order. This represents my life in the wrong order. First thing in my life, God goes in my life first. Very first thing. Then, family. Let me put this in so you can see the front of it. Now, there's really no, I didn't practice doing this in a certain order or something. I'm just going to put it in there where you can read. I don't know if you can read God there or not, but it's facing, it's facing the front. And then, Work. Let's put work in there. Got to work. Social media. Education. Homework. Working around the house. Taking care of business. It needs to be taken care of. Let's put that in there like that. Hobbies. Hobbies. Okay. And all the other little bitty stuff. The stuff that we do in our lives, okay? Got to get it all in there. One little washer fell out. When you put God first, everything fits. In fact, you might, eat. God will bless you so much, you'll have a room for a little extra. Praise God, it all fits. It all fits when you put God first. It all works out when you put God first. He makes it work when you put God first. Time and time again in my life, he has made it work in my life. When, even when situations looked impossible, he became the miracle worker and worked miracles. When I was about 40 years old, after almost 10 years of full-time ministry, I traveled all over the nation for about 10 years. Praise team can come on up, yeah. Uh, and then after going through 10 years of full-time ministry, I experienced a broken 
marriage. Went through, went through a divorce. I was contemplating going to Bible college. I never will forget, I was contemplating going to a Bible college. I had already been in ministry for full time for 10 years. And I had some relatives come to my home, come to, to where I lived. And I never will forget having, I guess, a two and a half hour conversation that day. I never will forget it. For quite a long time we talked. And this person tried and tried and tried and tried to get me to give up the idea of going to a Bible college. This person told me things like, made statements like this. Let me, let me quote this person. Rusty, what you need to do is go to a good college and get a good degree where you can make a living. Do you ever want to have a wife? Do you ever want to have children? See, I didn't ever have any, I had never had any children. I had been married and went through divorce. Do you ever want to have any children? You're going to have to be able to support those kids when you have children. You're going to have to be able to take care of them. But I knew that God was speaking to me to go to Bible college and put him first. She preached at me. I never will forget it. This person preached at me. You need to put God first in your life. I mean, I'm sorry. You need to put your education first. That's what she was telling me. I didn't say anything about God. She needs to, you need to put your education as the most important thing in your life and get you a good education so you can get out and get a good job, a good professional job and make plenty of money and take care of a family because you won't, you're not qualified to have a family right now. You, you, you can't support a family. And it's true. I was broke. I was very broke. This family member, actually it was more than one family member, but that on that one occasion, that one day, this family member tried their best to persuade me to continue or to go to a secular college and get a good job. But I prayed about it and I sought God. And I even, I remember I even fasted and I sought God. And God said, go to Bible college, son, and I'll take care of you. And that's what I did. I went to Bible college. And in the process, he gave me everything I ever wanted. He gave me a beautiful wife that I love, cherish, and adore. Gave me children. If you put God first, He will take the broken pieces of your life and He'll put it all back together. He can heal the hurt. He can heal the brokenness and the mistakes of the past. He's a God of love and understanding and forgiveness. Don't underestimate his power. He can give you the permanent change that you've been seeking. He can give you what you want today, what you desire, what you need the most in your life. But in order to do it, you've got to put him first in your life. In every area. You've got to put him first in every area in your finances, in your relationships, in your marriage, if you're married, in your home. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about, I'm talking about, I'm going to go ahead and say, I'm talking about not watching those filthy movies. In your home, take control. Clean up your home. Clean up your relationships. Clean up your habits. Clean up the things that you can and put God first. And I promise you, he will begin to work. Things will begin to click. You know what I mean by that expression? Things will just start working out. Things that you're, you'll be amazed about. You'll say, wow, God, I, didn't, I never dreamed that you would do this in my life. And it's just clicking. And you're moving fo forward in life. And you're accomplishing things. And things are getting done. And it's just clicking. It's just clicking. It's just clicking. Why? Because you put God first. Hallelujah. Praise God. But you must 
put him first in your life. Don't underestimate his power. He can give you the permanent change that you've been seeking. Let's all stand and let's worship the Lord.